Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our fourth session of the Point of Pride LGBTQ Business Summit. My name is Angela Huey. I am the co-founder and president of One Community, and we are so excited that you are all able to join us today. The goal of today's panel is to talk about how LGBTQ inclusion impacts our ability as a region and as a state to attract top talent and business. We know that the cost of discrimination is very high and that as, as we move forward as a state, it's really important that we are inclusive uh, if we want to succeed in a 21st century way and also to attract and retain top talent. We've had some good news in the recent weeks with the Supreme Court uh, ruling uh, saying that gay and transgender Americans are protected under Title VII in employment, but in the state of Arizona, it is still not unlawful to discriminate in housing or in public accommodations. At One Community, we've always really believed that the business community would really help lead the way towards an LGBTQ inclusive state. We know that uh, overwhelmingly large businesses have had fully inclusive policies um, in the workplace for several years. And we also know from an attraction and retention of top talent standpoint that employers want to make sure that their employees have the same protections outside of the workplace as they do inside of the workplace. If you have questions to ask our panelists today, we have a Q&A box. Um, I'm super excited uh, to get this robust conversation going and we'll get it started off with an introduction from who our panelists are. Neil, can you kick us off? Thank you, Angela, and hello to all the other panelists and hello to everyone who's watching today. I'm Neil Giuliano. I'm the president and CEO of Greater Phoenix Leadership, which is the consortium of all the CEO level talent within the uh, business community here in the greater Phoenix area. Glenn? I got, I got myself off mute. I'm, I'm making progress. <laughs> Hi, Glenn Hammer, president and CEO of the Arizona Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And our, our job is to advocate on all levels. Uh, we spend most of our time on, on the state level. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. Tyler? Hi, Tyler Cottaway. <clears throat> I am a manager in PayPal and enterprise risk management and the leader um, of PayPal Pride at a global level, our employee resource group for LGBTQ plus people. And PayPal is a staunch supporter of LGBTQ inclusion. We so are. we're so thankful you're here, Tyler. And I do want to say uh, a, a nice shameless plug for PayPal. You're the, <laughs> you're the presenting sponsor of the summit. So we wouldn't be having these robust conversations mm -hmm. without PayPal really, you know, uh, getting out there and supporting uh, important inclusionary dialogue like today. So thank you, Tyler. You're most welcome. Senator Kate Brophy McGee is with us. Hi, I'm State Senator Kate Brophy McGee from District 28. This is, I just completed my 10th session in the Arizona legislature. Prior to that, I served 10 years on the school board. I am so honored to be with this distinguished panel and the one community. So thank you for having me. We're glad you're here, Kate. Daniel? It's an honor to be on with everybody, including Senator Kate Brophy McGee, um, who I've worked with a lot on the last couple of years on LGBTQ inclusion issues. Um, my name is Daniel Hernandez. I'm a state representative from district number two and the chair of the LGBTQ caucus here in the state of Arizona. As legislator. Well, we are so excited to get this conversation started. So Neil and Glenn, I wanna start with a question for the two of you. Uh, we, again, this recent U.S. Supreme Court decision, how does it change the landscape for LGBTQ rights, right? We know that based on the Supreme Court decision, it is now unlawful to discriminate in employment nationwide, um, and that this ruling is really important in the state of Arizona, which is still one of 27 states in the nation where it's not unlawful to still discriminate in housing and, of course, in public accommodations. What's your reaction to the ruling and how do you think it impacts um, your organizations and the business community as we move forward? Glenn, why don't you start? Th thank you, Neil. And, and first I wanna just say, uh, Angela, what you've done, you, you've changed, it, it's not just uh, on the legal side and, and, and the ordinances uh, and the legislation that you've been able to to move forward in Arizona, you, you've changed the culture for the state for the better permanently. And that's an extraordinary accomplishment. Uh, we, we strongly support the US Supreme Court decision. Uh, I'm a non-practicing 
lawyer uh, from from ASU, but I've never really practiced. You know, my understanding is that the Title VII protections filter down to all levels of 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 government uh, as they should. And I believe there was also I, I didn't look at it carefully enough, but there was a Washington Post story in the last 24 hours or so that also indicates that this ruling uh, will likely set the stage for further protections in, in some other areas, accommodation, uh, some of the other areas that, that you mentioned. Uh, it's the right ruling. We want to make Arizona uh, even more welcoming. I, I believe that that is part of the state's DNA. It doesn't always necessarily radiate out to other states, but I'm a guy who came from New York, and I'll just tell you, I never would have had these same opportunities if I moved from Arizona to New York. So uh, it's a great uh, Supreme Court decision. We've got to make sure that Arizona laws and enforcement uh, reflect that decision. And we also know that there's uh, more work to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Neil? Yeah, uh, thanks, Angela. Thanks, Glenn. I think I will just add that there is an element of a leveling of the playing field from an employment standpoint that was important with regard to the Supreme Court case. Uh, no longer is Arizona at a disadvantage to neighboring states like Colorado, New Mexico, uh, Nevada, California, right, for that all are already providing uh, employment non-discrimination practices. So that's good. Uh, my members and Glenn's members now who are trying to attract the very best and top talent no longer have to be worried about an organization coming to Arizona uh, and bringing all of their employees, some of whom may be LGBTQ and, and hesitant to come to a state that didn't provide those kinds of protections. It also will help uh, with the retention of organizations and people uh, because uh, as we know, the corporate community has led the way on non-discrimination in this country along with municipalities and that partnership has enabled the changing of the culture in society to get to the place where a, a case like the one that got to the Supreme Court would be able to be uh, approved and supported the way that it was. So that's all good. Uh, we're certainly not fully protected, or as I would say, fully free uh, in Arizona yet, because we can still, if you're LGBTQ, you can be denied a place to live. And in fact, I know of situations like that where LGBT couples have gone in to rent an apartment and got the up down and the look down from people who are like, you know, in the, in the agency office and well, we'll get back to you. We're gonna need more information. It is, seemed pretty clear to those folks that they were not wanted to live there. So you can still deny housing and you can still deny public accommodation uh, in Arizona, which is a, a very important issue for uh, all citizens, but certainly for LGBTQ citizens. So it was a good ruling, uh, welcomed, important for the business community, but more work that needs to be done in Arizona. I absolutely, thank you, Neil, um, you're so spot on. Um, and I think with public accommodations, people don't realize, I think a lot of folks think that this is about a baker or a stationary store. Public accommodations includes doctor, doctor's offices and hospitals. So it, currently in the state of Arizona, unless you're in one of the five municipalities that have LGBTQ inclusive municipal ordinances, including in public accommodations, it's not unlawful to turn a, a gay or transgender person away. And um, we certainly, in particular, in the midst of a global pandemic, want to make sure that people have equal access to health care, right? Uh, Senator Brophy McGee and uh, Representative Fernandez, this next question is for you. We are thrilled about this uh, Supreme Court ruling. However, earlier in the week, you know, the Arizona uh, uh, the Arizona Attorney General did state that the court filing that the, that the state legislature could actually pass legislation clarifying that the definition of sex does not include sexual orientation or transgender status, meaning that there could be a bill introduced in the next session uh, where the state of Arizona attempts to go against the Supreme Court ruling. Do you actually see the legislature acting to defy the Supreme Court ruling and how would that affect the business community? And then the follow-up question is, what role can the business community play in discouraging such, uh, you know, really preemptive action? So Daniel, do you want to go first or would you like I know, to? These are tough. They're like really thoughtful <laughs> questions today. You go first, Kate. 
Well, first of all, um, on any given day, any legislator can introduce a bill that says anything. The question to be asked is whether or not it gets it gains traction with the legislature as a whole, um, gets assigned to a committee, first read. We had a very bad uh, sex education bill this past session that didn't even get first read. So it has to go through all the processes. And then if it does make it out of committee, go to the floor and uh, then do the same thing in the other chamber, assuming it makes it out of the chamber. So do I see a legislator acting to defy? Yes, I do. Do I see that gaining any traction? I do not. And as a matter of fact, we'll do everything I can to stop it. It's not good for Arizonan, Arizonans. It's not good for Arizona, it's not good for a national image. One of the things that I campaigned on and have continually campaigned on is Arizona's image in the nation. And we have done so much over the past six years uh, with uh, Governor Ducey at the helm to change that. And we need to keep heading in that direction and not treat people differently. Thank Daniel? you. I think Senator Tabor McGee hits a really important point, which is with 90 legislators, any one lawmaker can introduce any bill. The real question is, will the bill go anywhere? And we've seen on bills that we don't necessarily think are great bills that they sometimes go someplace. Um, we saw the trans athlete bill this year, make it all the way through the House, never be heard, never be assigned to committee in the Senate. I think that's why having a process in which you have to go through both houses, go through committees is important because it serves as a good filter for us to potentially stop bad pieces of legislation. So can it be introduced? Yes. Do I see with the current majorities and with potential changes next year, this bill actually getting traction, getting all the way through? Highly unlikely. And I think one of the biggest reasons is because we have been working in partnership and we've been making this issue one that's not partisan at all. Um, when I talk to, uh, to folks about LGBTQ discrimination and about some of the bills that have been moving through the Capitol the last couple of years, some of my first calls are Neil and Glenn, or I say, here's the crazy thing one of my colleagues has introduced. I'm giving you a heads up because for me and for Kate and for those of us that say we need to come together to find solutions, it's crucial that we have the support of the business community because we've seen that in the past, Arizona has had black stains on our reputation because of crazy thing legislators do. So we've moved away from the 2010s when we had things like SB 1070 and SB 1062, which thankfully got vetoed. But now it's not enough to just play defense on bad legislation, but it's really time to flip the script and say, okay, we've stopped the bad stuff for the last four sessions. Now, how do we get to move good stuff? And that's where having it be a nonpartisan issue where we're bringing everybody to the table from activists in the community to the business community and then stakeholders like legislators and groups like One Community is so crucial because we're never gonna get anything done if we leave anybody out. And I think that's where when we look to 2021's next legislative session, if there is a bill that's introduced to try and roll back what the Supreme Court just did, we already have a bill that we've already introduced for the last four years that actually addresses not just employment, but also housing and public accommodations. Uh, one thing I should add related to the business community, and I wanna echo uh, Glenn's comments at the beginning of this panel. One community and Angela have, you have paved the way, you have built such a solid, nonpartisan, inclusive foundation, um, your grace, your um, kindness, your, your approach to the whole thing has really set the stage, I think, for Arizona to take these next steps. So I should have started by saying that. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, I, I appreciate it. Tyler, speaking of the business community, PayPal has, you've been out front when we, uh, we're able to have an education hearing around the nonpartisan bill last year. You know, you spoke and talked about PayPal support of a statewide update. When bad bills were introduced, like HB 2706, PayPal proudly got out front and said, 
this bill is wrong and this bill is bad, not just for business, but for the state of Arizona. And more importantly, this bill harms vulnerable Arizonans. And uh, you really got your team together to ensure that uh, PayPal's voice was uh, included in the narrative of, of, you know, really, really backing down HB 2706. So here's the question with all of that. Now it is against the law to discriminate against gay and transgender people at work. And we know that so many businesses like PayPal already have inclusive policies. Talk about why you believe inclusive policies work. What have you seen the benefits in the workplace uh, to inclusion being, right? Like it's not just the right thing to do. It really is good business, right? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and I think you hit a, a very important point for us. We've, we've, never seen the inclusion of civil rights for LGBTQ people as anything that hinders a business. Um, practicing that before it becomes the law was natural business case for us. So I think when you think about um, why inclusive policies work, you as a brand cannot afford not to do business with everyone. You know, I love one community's open statement, Arizona being open to business for everyone. So if your brand does not embrace all communities, um, your, your brand is very, very bad. Uh, you, don't, you don't gain adoption. Um, for PayPal in particular, and, and I think you see this across not only the tech sector, but just larger companies in general, um, inclusive policies work because it creates a safe place at work. Um, when people can come to work and be their authentic selves, um, yes, it creates a fabulous work culture. We get to meet vibrant, diverse people, but they are more productive. They're more engaged. They feel part of being one team. Um, they see themselves as part of the product that is put out, the service that is put out, um, as opposed to being a cog in a wheel. Um, when we see people included in the workplace and really our, our practices around inclusion, um, I think at a baseline, you see a lot of companies with non-discrimination policies. We like to think of ourselves as having anti-discrimination programs. So really creating awareness around how to be inclusive, training all of our leaders on unconscious and conscious bias. Um, how do we measure ourselves? I think it's very important, you know, as a lot of companies talk about diversity and inclusion, we've always been one to, to pride ourselves on, on walking the talk too. So publishing your metrics, you know, hey, we want to achieve parity and gender pay. Let's publish what the gender pay equity looks like. Let's publish what our statistics are on um, different diverse communities and layers of leadership. Um, I can say just in the time, you know, I've been at PayPal as we um, formed ourselves into a, a new public company, um, we have seen a transformation in um, leadership strata where we see um, queer leaders for the first time, you know, in, in higher positions. We see um, middle management, myself included, having all members of our rainbow community, members of different um, ethnic and racial backgrounds, all coming together and, and seeing representation. And I think that's just the, the fruit of embracing people and seeing the potential of all people. Um, and I would say too, just as a, as a shameless plug for ourselves, being so emphatic on diversity and inclusion and taking these stances um, legislatively, you know, we, one of our first things I was so proud that we did when we became a public company was we pulled our development plans from North Carolina who passed that, that terrible bathroom bill. Um, and at that time, you know, our stock, um, we just split from eBay and was trading at around $27. Um, we had close to around 180 million active users. Today, um, diversity does not slow us down. Inclusion does not slow us down. Um, our stock is trading at $170. Um, we're, we're moving in on 400 million active customers. And we have a five-year plan to have a billion active users. You don't do that by not embracing everyone. And that was HB2 in North Carolina, Tyler, I remember that. And oh. uh, that's how uh, we met, uh, was that first conversation around how horrible HB2 was and PayPal strong stance. Neil, I see you shaking your head up and down an awful lot. Is there anything you want to add to Tyler's comments? <laughs> only, to, only appreciation for the leadership of the corporate community on a national level and certainly uh, within Arizona as well. Uh, it's just very important and, and businesses get it right. They get it right on the judgment with regard to what's morally right and they get it right on the judgment with regard to what uh, makes smart business sense and is just the, the right way to uh, attract and retain employees and keep those employees and their families 
uh, in, in mind for having good, strong policies like this. So it's, it's really greatly appreciated. Wonderful. So Neil, this, and, and Glenn, this next question's for you. Um, and, and if you all want to chime in, please feel free to. But I, I've watched the great work that Neil has been doing with uh, GPL and, and what Glenn's been doing. So that's why we're going to start with the two of you. We've talked about this in every summit panel that we're in the middle of a national outcry to change the status quo and that we have to acknowledge systematic racism and, and not just acknowledge it, but actually take meaningful action. So talk about how your organization uh, is moving from statements to actions. And then how have you personally evolved or learned from the last several weeks? Uh, I, I can start on that one. So. Um, you know, the CEOs have now had, uh, my, in my organization at a leadership level as well as a, a committee level have had some really terrific conversations. And I, I unequivocally can state that their commitment to engage on these issues of racial inequity, uh, systemic racism are sincere and heartfelt and we will be in this conversation uh, moving toward action and being supportive of the changes that will be necessary for the long haul. Uh, a couple of takeaways on that is that it's important to listen uh, to everyone who's involved in the conversation. And that's uh, the folks obviously at, at my level that I work with, the CEOs, but they know and are practicing listening within their own organizations and out to their customer base and their vendors to ensure that they are well informed and have a, a deep appreciation. And uh, time and again, we have been reminded that, um, you know, if you don't speak out, uh, nothing will change. And so the conversations about uh, individuals or organizations and whatever they may be that may have had a strong voice in the past and now everyone is realizing well maybe we didn't think through those voices well enough maybe we didn't get them enough consideration that we uh, that we should and so we're committed to listening um, to everyone at every age level from every different cohort uh, I had uh, the opportunity, uh, even in, in even in the heat with the, with COVID, to go to four or five of the different protests in downtown Phoenix and the one in downtown Tempe as well, uh, to observe and to listen and to be a part and of that that activity, so that the young people and it is primarily the young people, and I commend them for it, that are leading these efforts and leading these conversations, know that uh, they're not alone that uh, there are people of my generation that uh, know that we need to listen and that we need to respond in a thoughtful and direct way. So I feel good about that. I feel good the direction that we are going in as an organization. We are looking at uh, forming a racial equity advancement project that will be sustained and woven throughout all of the various aspects of the work of Greater Phoenix Leadership and all of our committees. This is not, although the focus is very very clearly on the uh, importance of criminal justice issues and law enforcement issues and use of force and so forth. Uh, and I have a deep appreciation for those having worked in politics and government at the local level for many, many years. Um, but it's also about housing and it's also about the economy and it's also about access to healthcare that uh, a lot of the folks are talking about and we need to be respond to those issues and be sensitive to those issues as well. So this work will be woven throughout our portfolio of activity uh, that the CEOs in this region are engaged on. And, and I'm, I look forward to doing that in partnership with many, many others. Thank you, Neil. Glenn? Well, there's a lot here. And, and, and I, I do want to thank uh, Senator McGee for her thoughtful leadership over the years. It's not easy what, what she's done. And she has gone against, uh, she, she's taken a number of very difficult stances uh, given uh, some of the political circumstances. She does it time and time again. And I'm glad that I, I feel like the public and the party have caught up to the Senator. And uh, I'm a, you know, Representative Hernandez is an American hero. He's right, when he calls me, it's not a good, it's not a good bill. I'll just, I'll just I, won't get it, I won't get any deeper than that, but it's very rarely, it, it, it's like, oh my God. Uh, you know, I've had, we, this is, this is a, a moment of action for the country. You know, I, I, we've had great conversations. I've, I've, 
I'm the dad of three daughters. My oldest is going to ASU next year. I have a 15 year old and an 11 year old. And I've, I've in my, my uh, wisdom to them is that the world is completely different after all these things. Whatever we all experienced before between uh, COVID, an economic crisis, a health crisis, uh, uh, racial uh, injustice uh, crisis, the world is completely different and we can make it a better world. And one of the things that they've said to me, particularly my two oldest, uh, is that I need to listen more, is that the, the young people are at a different place. It's almost like it's a different, uh, like dogs could hear certain frequencies. And, and what I've taken out of this is I, I really need to do a, a better job of, of listening. And I also believe that uh, I need to do a better job of, of leading at times. Uh, I'll, I'll say I, I feel like we have, thanks to your leadership, helped out in certain areas. But I would say, you know, I, 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 I want to applaud Neil. He's been very, very proactive. And, and uh, I want to be more aggressive and across the spectrum. So you know, we've, we've got the, the issues that are the center of this call. You, you mentioned the racial inequality. I just, I'm part of the U.S. Chamber Steering Committee on the Racial Inequality Initiative. If we get this right, and this sort of gets to Tyler's part on the racial inequality, that adds about $8 trillion to our GDP by 2050. So it's not just right morally, it's right for the business community. And, and, and also I think of the work when we talk reputationally, uh, when, when I think about some of the issues surrounding dreamers, you know, we, we've got to make sure that uh, their situation, that there is legalization with a path to citizenship. So they don't need to leave, uh, live, live in fear. So if I had to summarize, this is, this is an incredible moment in our country's history. We have to seize it. The world doesn't exist the way it did three months ago. Let's make it a better, more inclusive world uh, for us and and, and, the, and the generations to come. Yeah, Angela, if I could just add on to that. Thank you, Glenn, that you're, you're spot on. Uh, I wanna add my thanks and acknowledge the courage that Senator Brophy McGee has exhibited uh, being a member of the majority party in Arizona where most, overwhelmingly, most of the majority party in Arizona has not supported LGBT equality. That took a lot of courage. And the, the few of you that have done that uh, are to be thanked and appreciated, and we're grateful for having for you having stood with the LGBT commu community. Uh, I will add this though: we are now at 75 to 80 percent of the American public that supports full equality. It does not take a whole lot of courage anymore for people to stand on the right side of history and with the LGBTQ community outside of a very narrow group of folks, perhaps within the party the majority party currently in Arizona uh, in their primary election, right? The, the public at large is, is and has moved on from the division and the myths and the mistruths and the misleading information about sexual orientation and gender identity. The vast majority of the public anymore knows that those old myths and stories and tales are not true. So we need to just encourage the folks who need that little extra push uh, to stand for full equality and, and, and do so in reflection of the fact that this is where the public is based on the reality of the information that we know today versus the understanding and interpretations that we might have had 15, 20 years ago. So thank you, Senator Brophy McGee, uh, for your leadership. I know that was not always easy, uh, but we're grateful for having you there. Senator, do you want to add anything? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of putting all of this together and I appreciate the thanks and um, appreciate Daniel reaching out to me. Remember you came into the committee hearing room and to get me to sign on to your bill. And that was the start of a wonderful uh, relationship and friendship that will go long past however long I'm in the legislature. But and as far as my colleagues, I'm figuring they're gonna catch up at some point and also catch on. Uh, we are small government, pro-business, 
pro-freedom uh, as a party and this worrying about someone and their personal lives, it, it just, it doesn't line up, it doesn't match. But this is where the business community can really play a key part in helping my colleagues step away from their ideologies and really looking at, look at what is happening across their state and across their communities. And that it's possible to reconcile um, the different uh, people loving in different ways and living in different ways uh, with building the Arizona we love and call home. And again, Angela, one community, you and Daniel and all of you have really set a proactive, positive, uh, grace, you know, when they go low, you go high approach to this, that when you couple it with the business community and their insistence, we're going to get there and we will be better for it as a state. Daniel? Uh, it's the mutual admiration society that you've accumulated on the call today. Um, you know, I'm extremely grateful to the business community, to Neil, GPL, Glenn Hammer and the chamber and to Senator Kate Brophy McGee and others who aren't on the call because what we've been able to do is take an issue that in 2004 was being used as a wedge issue during a presidential campaign and now we're openly having conversations about okay marriage is done, workplace protections are done, we repealed no promo homo, now let's dig into things like conversion therapy, like making sure that we address some of the other systemic issues that are affecting the community. So I think we've done a great job of educating people and that's what we really need to focus in on because we can see a big change even with some of the same individuals when we work to educate and make sure that we're having people in the LGBTQ community get to know their lawmakers. Because once you know these people that are being impacted, once you share stories, it's very different. I've been in advocacy for 12 years. Um, hard to believe I'm only 30, but this is my 12th session at the state capitol because I started when I was 18 advocating for things. And the thing that makes the biggest difference is when we bring people to share their stories with lawmakers. Because it's really easy when you have an abstract number and everybody has their own funny math because that's how the capitol works. But what really makes an impact is when people come in and share their personal stories. There's one last thing that I wanted to kind of add. So I think sometimes this happens a lot, and I don't think it's happening today with this conversation, but I think a lot of times there's the, you are a part of the LGBTQ community, or you are black, or you are Latino, or you are Native American. The LGBTQ community is one where there are so many intersections. LGBTQ people are every kind of people that there could possibly, they are poor, they are rich, they are young, they are old, they are fat, they are thin, they are Latino, they're black. And what has happened is the movement for LGBTQ equality started in Stonewall with trans women of color. And what unfortunately has happened is too often we've made advancements for the L and the G community, but not necessarily the T community. And that's where I really appreciate that while we haven't been able to successfully pass the bill in the state legislature, the bill has always been fully inclusive for housing, employment, and also public accommodations. Because other places have tried to say, okay, well, if we kind of adjust and do all these gymnastics, we can get protections for the gay lesbian, gays and lesbians, but we're not gonna do anything for trans people because we don't wanna talk about bathrooms or we don't wanna talk about that controversial stuff and making a commitment from the beginning and saying, we're gonna include everybody and we're gonna wait until the right time so that we can make it all happen for everybody at once. Because this is not one of those things where you can just chip away at it and get it done over time. This is one of those things where we'll probably have one or two shots at this. And if we don't get it right, then we're gonna leave people behind for maybe a generation or longer. And I think that's why I'm really appreciative of everybody on the call today because we have to have a long game. The LGBTQ community here in Arizona has realized we have had a lot of momentum and a lot of wins, but there's still a long way to go to make sure that everybody that lives and works in Arizona has every protection that they're due, but it might take a couple more tries. It takes a couple of years 
to move bills through to the process and the patience so that we can educate other lawmakers, especially those who have been in the majority for the last you know, 60 years almost in the House, but also in the business community, because 10 years ago, if you told me that we'd have a panel with Glenn Hammer and Neil Giuliano and Kate Rovi McGee talking about LGBTQ inclusion, I don't think this would have happened. But that's a testament to the work and the education that you all have been doing. And I think we need to keep doing that for the general public as well. So that way it's not just Daniel and Kate's crazy idea at the Capitol, it's something that we're getting behind at every level of civic and public life. Well said, Daniel. You know, that uh, you sound like the walking, talking reason that we called ourselves one community. That is the point. LGBTQ people are members of all communities. Uh, I always say we didn't call ourselves gay community. We didn't call ourselves women's community. We called ourselves one community, right? Because when we bring everyone together, we all really have a much more sustainable, livable future. And that's what really matters to us at One Community. Tyler, you've been listening intently uh, and shaking your head. I, I know you have some commentary before we move on to the next question, because this is just naturally just an absolutely remarkable conversation. Oh, amazing conversation. And really echo everyone's sentiments. I think these conversations, this activity, and what you do, Angela, is why we're, why we're where we're at. Um, there is awareness raising in the business community that still needs to take place. Um, you know, making that full transition to being inclusive or top employers for all people, LGBTQ people, but all people um, is still going on. Um, businesses are still figuring this out. Um, I think when we think of recent national outcry, um, the uprising of Black Americans against unfair treatment by police, um, and, and really systemic racism in general, it is important to think of the difference in, in words and actions. Um, I, I'm, of course, very proud to work at PayPal, where we put up $500 million to Racial Equity Fund, um, set aside from our balance sheet um, to fund grants for Black business owners, um, you know, diverse business community owners, um, to fund nonprofits, to um, raise our own standards, to increase funding for our employee resource and affinity groups, um, help us promote mentorship programs, and help us recruit. Um, I think businesses have such an important part to play in the, in the history that's being written um, in terms of how we reacted to being confronted with the naked truth of inequity in America. Um, you know, we have lived with it. Um, people in the LGBT community can attest, just as people of color can attest of living with inequity. Um, and we're at that pivotal point where we, we are calling it out that we are an unequal nation. Um, and it is so important that businesses, especially big business, um, who has achieved so much wealth, um, gives back and make sure that we empower people. And I really wanna echo back to the point earlier, profit and purpose are not incompatible. Um, having a purpose that is good for the world, good for this country, good for humans, um, is good for your business in the long run. Um, businesses that survive the test of time are ones that build durable ties to their community and not exploit their community. So I think as we, as we think of the evolution of businesses, um, we have to think of businesses that uh, seek to empower people as those that are gonna make it in the long run. They're gonna be the businesses 100 years from now um, that are still branded and still functioning in, in, a, in a largely similar way. So um, echo everyone's sentiments, but really personally, we have taken the moment in, in PayPal Pride to educate everyone on the important contributions of trans people. And, and not just to you know, the Stonewall uprisings, but we, we do a, a history presentation that shows the contributions of trans people going back to the times of antiquity. Um, you know, we're talking Egypt, we're talking trans people being visible and out um, from the beginning of time and just really doing a nice historical arc. And then getting into how businesses still have that um, duty to listen, you know, how this has all impacted me. One thing that, that I took away, this was brought up by um, a trans employee who's also a woman of color, um, the uprising, the outcry against um, police brutality. Um, where was that in the LGBT community when 26 trans women of color um, have been murdered? 
Um, and we see this put out in um, great organizations. We see celebrations of the need for visibility in transgender people, but my personal learning was um, this, this outrage should have been present and, and equally vigilant in our community. Um, it's something I personally took to heart. So a lot of listening, a lot of actions to come, but I'm very, very, very uplifted by all the leaders on the call today um, and, and the actions they've taken. I know I'm in good hands and I know the business community is in good hands with you. Thank you, Tyler. And we are in good hands with you and PayPal walking alongside of us. So Tyler, uh, you, you're talking about the importance of awareness building, the, the, the importance inside of PayPal of really listening and educating all of your employees about uh, the history of LGBTQ Americans and in particular trans Americans. Have you found externally uh, that because you have your campus here in Arizona that you've had challenges when you've been trying to attract and retain top talent because the state has not listened and has not uh, doesn't understand the history and the benefits of being a, a, as inclusive as we should be yet. You know, unfortunately, yes. Um, you you talk to it, and I think we won't own this exclusively as an injury of those types of laws. But um, talk to any talent recruiter who is trying to bring. Um, talent in, especially for niche and technical roles. And one of the particular things is, how am I gonna fit in in Arizona? Um, they'll, they'll ask questions about your benefits. People, you know, potential candidates, they are going to um, grill you about how, how are you inclusive? How, how, are, how are my health benefits protected? Um, what are your facilities like? But you think about it, the bigger facility, if you will, is the state in which you live. Um, you know, it's, it's really an unfair disadvantage for a recruiter to have to speak to, you know, the crystal ball of where civil rights will be at um, in, in a year, two years, three years, that they should be promoting a company. But it, oftentimes, you know, you have to, you have to sell that. Don't, don't just listen to the outward media. I know we've, we've gotten these few black eyes. Please continue to come here. Please live here. You know, we, we have this vibrant community. Um, that's not a, a disadvantage you want to put recruiters at. Um, you know, as Arizona tries to build um, its own like desert Silicon Valley and have a vibrant tech culture, we have so many niche roles that need to be filled. And I would hate to think that someone who is transgender who can fill that role wouldn't consider living here because um, they feel excluded because not only excluded, but they feel unwanted. I would hate to think that that someone would fear like, can I go to the doctor? Um, what if I'm, I'm in, in need of really emergency services? Am I going to get those? Can I go to a resort without being looked at funny and, and actually asked to leave because I hold hands with my boyfriend? Um, those are all things that I think recruiters um, shouldn't have to deal with. And really anyone trying to attract customers too. So I think a business that headquarters here too has that kind of same mentality. We're, we're of course headquartered in California, but I think of all the businesses is that um, have set up HQ shops here. Um, one of the first things people do as customers when they think of um, who you are as a culture and who you are as a brand, um, look to your history and your story, the about us. And when you're a proud Arizonan company and that brand gets tainted a little bit, um, you're, kind of, you're kind of dragged into that mud a little bit. So I think, I think to that extent, it's so much easier to recruit when you don't have to answer those questions. When, when you, if you are asked those questions, you can probably say we're all inclusive. Um, your rights are protected, um, not just by our company, but by the state. So it, so it sounds like this is a symphony of everyone saying the right thing to do is to move forward and to, to introduce a bipartisan bill. And this is a question uh, from uh, one of our attendees as well is, is there an intent to introduce a bipartisan bill for a statewide update in, in housing and public accommodations next year and um, do you all see the benefit of making sure that this becomes law, that we become a, a state that truly celebrates and respects and protects uh, each and every one of us equally? Neil, I see you shaking your head. Well, I, yeah, I think it's imperative. It's a matter of uh, timing and sequencing, whether it could be done by executive order or whether we wait until uh, the legislative session that comes up. I don't know what the right what the answer is to that or what the, the right path is, but it, it to me seems that this is something that we just will have to do to make sure that we are, are gonna be able to stay competitive and uh, to just do the right thing as well. But I, the, I would leave it to the professional elected officials at the time right now <laughs> to determine that and, uh, and understand the balance of that issue versus other issues and what, how that 
may be able to work its way through. Uh, of course, it seems like that you know, there's not going to be a special session for this topic. So that will be after a November election. And, uh, and, and if anyone can predict what everything looks like in January, you're, you're better than me. Glenn, your thoughts? Is 2021 the year? If it's not under executive action or an executive order, is 2021 the year? I, I would say that it is. And, you know, we, we need to make sure that our laws reflect our, our values. And our values need to be welcoming for all. I mean, the case is, it's a moral case. Uh, you know, Tyler's comments about uh, the economic case shouldn't be lost on anyone in terms of how well uh, PayPal has done uh, o over the years. And, uh, and by the way, we, we use PayPal, it's a great, it is a great company. Uh, so we, we have some work to do. Uh, I do think that the, the Supreme Court uh, decision is going to be very helpful in, in, in that work. And the other thing I'll say that, uh, and I can assure you this is not uh, uh, international spying, but uh, I will admit my, my wife has been listening because I wanted her to listen to this conversation. And she said something to me that's very, very uplifting. And she said, you know, for our girls in the schools, this, this conversation would almost seem archaic. This is like, right. common. yeah, it's like. Uh, Why are we still having this conversation? <laughs> it, yeah, seriously. And I mean, when I want to feel old, all I do is I pull out a newspaper, a physical newspaper, and then I, I feel like 100 years. So th this is where it's all going. That's where it all should be going. And, and our job, and Neil stated it very well, is to make sure that the sequencing and the all gets done but 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 uh we have work to do and it's and it's and it's right around the corner if, but what i'm hearing from both of you uh who represent the you know the largest most powerful uh companies in the state and tyler of course representing paypal is it's time it's time we work together and and we're all very out front and very public about the fact that it's time that we have a statewide update and, and that, we, it, that, that it is a moral imperative and it's a sustainability imperative and that uh, we need to be even more public about uh, the need for creating equal protections for LGBTQ Arizonans. Um, and I'm so happy to tell you we're videotaping this conversation, so you're all on the record, of course. <laughs> so, <laughs> Senator McGee and Representative Hernandez, uh, the business community is out and with you. Uh, do you think 2021 is, is the year we actually get this done? I sure hope so. Um, the ruling, uh, the Bergefell marriage ruling, the no promo homo falling, and then this Supreme Court ruling is the wave we need to catch and ride into the shore and finish it out in 2021. And I am so committed to doing that for housing and public accommodations. And um, I love Glenn talking about his girls and how they're educating him because that's exactly what my sons do with me. It's like, mom, it's no big deal. Um, the answer is yes, we will get this done. And I think there are going to be some retirements and some power structure shifts that will assist that. And I'll let Daniel speak to the House. You know, the funny thing is, I think we've had the votes to pass it in the Senate for the last three years, um, but the House has been the biggest challenge. Um, the bill wasn't even assigned to committee the last two years. So I think as we are seeing a House that will hopefully be more collaborative, that will hopefully work more closely together, we will keep showing people who have been in the majority and who may not be in the majority next session in the House, because it seems like the House is the chamber that's most likely to flip, that this is not a big, scary issue. One of the biggest challenges that I had was just the reality in the politics right now. I couldn't find a single member of the majority caucus to sign on to the bill in the House, because they said, well, so-and-so doesn't like it, and I don't want them to yell at me, so I'm just not, but if it goes up on the board, I'll vote for it. I think the time of having quiet support has come and passed. And now if somebody is with us, they need to be with us when it actually comes to moving bills forward, not sheepishly waiting until it gets up on the board and hoping that we can have their support. We need them to come out as Kate has and as others have 
on paper and actually co-sponsoring these pieces of legislation. I think 2021, I hope, will be the year that we get this done. But even if it doesn't, I think there is so much progress that we've made that we need to really double down. And unfortunately, because of COVID, we're not going to be able to do the education work before the next legislative session that I'd like to do, because we're probably not going to be able to have big public gatherings and we're not going to be able to have town halls to educate lawmakers in their districts. But it should be an encouraging sign that we will hopefully have the bill get introduced again. And we have folks like the Tech Council, I saw Steven Zilstra say uh, that they would support again. But what I would say is the day after we know who wins these elections, we all need to be reaching out to these lawmakers because there is a very short window. And with the way that Arizona counts its ballots, we may not know the results for up to two or three weeks after November 6th. So we need to make sure that December 1st or the end of November, whenever we find out who those folks that have made it through, we are reaching out to them and educating them about this issue because it's gonna be a very quick sprint to the first day of session and then before bills start moving through the process. Daniel, I will make this commitment to you right now uh, that we are, we are absolutely committed to doing virtual town halls to having to doing our state of LGBTQ Arizona presentation in to, with to any any group, um, uh, COVID is tough. It obviously doing things in person is difficult, um, but we are getting very good with Zoom, and and we will not rest. We will educate any group, any legislature. We will talk to anyone that wants to have this conversation and understand the importance of treating LGBTQ uh, Arizonans fairly. So. We'll do that well before uh, the November uh, general election. Wonderful. So I, I would just add in, I think that's uh, really, really appreciate that. And it's going to be important. Look, we can't underestimate or, or be, be naive about the uh, powerful forces that will uh, try to prevent uh, full equality from happening. And we have to understand where they're coming from. And we have to, we have to appreciate where they're coming from. Uh, but we also should not hesitate to challenge uh, those views as well, because the views that are going to stand in our way are going to come under the guise of uh, me being able to exercise my religion. I'm a Roman Catholic, my deeply held uh, beliefs, my religious beliefs, and this goes against those, and therefore uh, I can't support that because it's infringing upon my religion to do that. That's a somewhat of the argument that, that you're going to get, that we have received, and that we're going to continue to get. And we have to help people understand that no one, everyone should have their religious beliefs, whether they're mine or anybody that's on this call or anybody that's listening. Our government is not supposed to pick one deeply held religious belief over other religious beliefs. And there's a continuum of where religions of the world and religions in our own country stand on LGBTQ issues. Government's not supposed to pick one religion and say, this is the way society will be governed. Our government is supposed to treat us all equally. So it's not an infringement upon someone's religious beliefs or their religious liberty or their ability to practice their religion within their faith uh, to say that our government will treat everyone the same. Uh, and that's gonna be a difficult conversation uh, with some of our friends. And they are some of our friends who hold those views, but we need to have those conversations and, and help them understand these issues and, and not allow the prevailing narrative coming from uh, the views of those folks who use that as, a, as the argument against our equality. We can't allow that to go unchallenged and we have to be willing to have those tough conversations with people. Absolutely. Glenn, did you wanna add anything to Neil's point about tough conversations and the the importance of having these these more difficult conversations with people that are our friends and to help them understand that if you are open for business you should be open for business to everyone and and we should yeah. be in a state that treats all people fairly well I'll, I'll some of this has already been said the 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 culture and the public opinion on this has changed dramatically and i, I notice uh steve z of the tech council has been doing the chat thing uh, quite yeah. often, uh, he, he deserves a tremendous amount of credit. He's been a great leader within the business community for, for, for many years. And 
And when you take a look at where we want the economy to go and where the economy is going, and we're fortunate, this is a good story for Arizona with advanced manufacturing and technology. Uh, to get back to Neil's point, uh, that Supreme Court decision, the second that decision came out and the light bulb went off in my head, Arizona became more competitive. That very second, we became more competitive. So there's more work to be done. The way that you have done uh, the work with one community over the years, it's been extremely effective. And, and I expect in 2020, 2021, there will continue to be progress. And my final point is, there's always work that needs to, to be done. And you know, as long as we're advancing Arizona as a more welcoming place, as our state continues to grow, uh, we're, we're doing something good for, for, for all of our people. Well said, Glenn. Uh, and, and Steve says that you and Neil uh, and, and Steve need to take your teams and go talk to our elected officials. Neil's all in, Glenn. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure you're all in, too. That sounds uh, like a fantastic conversation and a great way to educate uh, folks uh, that are friends that just need some more education so they understand uh, the importance of LGBTQ inclusion. So. Uh, as long as they're wearing face masks and we're six feet apart, I'm in. All right. Social, absolutely. Social distancing. Social distancing. And is, hopefully we get to a point where that's not necessary. But is an absolute must. All right. We have two minutes left. Um, I want to give you all an opportunity just uh, to share some clothing, uh, closing thoughts with um, our remarkable attendees. It's very, this is a very exciting conversation. This is what happens when thoughtful people uh, that really want to move our state forward, get together. You have this remarkable commitment from Neil and Glenn and Steve and uh, the Tech Council to have these tough conversations now uh, so that we're prepared to uh, hopefully move this forward in 2021. Tyler, anything you want to add? <clears throat> yes, go off mute there. Um, I, I think to everyone in attendance, you, you've heard the actions of leaders, um, folks in the business community. Um, you're part not only of that business community, but you're part of the general community. And I can't stress enough the importance of voting, um, the importance of getting out into the community, being visible, being your authentic selves, and being heard. Um, raise your hand, raise your voices. Um, people are listening and, you know, silence is nothing that moves anything. We can't have conversations um, without speaking. Um, so don't don't just listen to the information. Don't just don't just ingest it, but really raise your voice. Um, and and I know it seems awkward sometimes, but I, I think Neil hit the the nail on the head with having awkward conversations. Don't talk just to people that think like you. Um, we we have to talk to the people that don't think like we do, um, that don't see things in this light, because these are not you know equality and having an open society and having um, all faiths and, and different things represented are not mutually exclusive. Um, and it's just a matter of getting that, that voice out. So please speak up. Um, I love speaking. Uh, you know, we, we all love, we all love getting up and, and testifying about um, the importance of equality in Arizona, the importance of equality in the world, but um, it's your voices and the voices of others like you that matter. Um, so please join us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tyler. And you're right, we need to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Senator Brophy McGee, your final closing thoughts. Once again, an honor to be here with this panel. And uh, I'm going to continue uh, following the model set by Daniel and Angela. Thoughtful conversation, building those relationships to the point where you have the connections to have those uncomfortable conversations. We will get there. We need to do so thoughtfully, deliberately, and bring as many with us as we possibly can. And I commit to doing that because I know it will build the Arizona we love and call home. Thank you so much. Kate, you are wonderful. And thank you for your courage. Uh, this was not the easiest uh, uh, conversation a couple years ago. Uh, and so we appreciate your, your steadfast and courageous leadership. Daniel? Thank you. So much. A lot of things have already been said that I don't want to repeat, but I just want to say that when we get through these elections, I'm looking forward to working with everybody on the panel and everybody who's watching at home today to 
to make sure that Arizona is a place that's open for everybody, whether you are trans, whether you're a person of color. It is an Arizona that I think we all want to live in, but we all have to work hard to make sure that it happens. So I'm looking forward to working with everybody. Hopefully, eight and myself will have good news after elections, but right now we both have tough campaigns. So don't want to take anything for granted and we both have to make sure that we do what we can to get reelected so that we can continue working on issues like this at the Capitol. Wonderful, thank you, Daniel. Glenn, your final thoughts? It's, uh, Angela, thank you for the chance to, to be part of this Zoom webinar. And I look forward to working with, with Neil and Steve and, and others in the business community. Uh, we're a welcoming state, we're a loving state, uh, and uh, I, I, I feel like we're on a uh, very positive trajectory. And thank you again, Angela, for your personal leadership. Thank you, Glenn. And Neil, take us home. Thank you, Angela. Thanks everyone at One Community, your team, your staff, to the folks who are on the call. Uh, thank you uh, for your visibility. You're, if you're a member of the LGBTQ community. Thank you for being visible, for living an authentic life. If you're an ally and a supporter, we're grateful because we cannot do this by ourselves. We are not the majority of the population. We do not have that kind of power by ourselves. We can only do it in partnership and with the support of uh, the allies in our community, both corporate community, municipal, as well as certainly, certainly uh, the business community, which was the focus of today's call. So very grateful, very happy to be a part of this and, and uh, look forward to the continued progress that we're going to make together. Thank you, Neil. Uh, and I just want to thank you all for your leadership and uh, for dedicating, you know, so much of your time and resources to ensuring that Arizona becomes the state that uh, we deserve to be, where we're a state that truly celebrates and respects and protects each and every one of us. Thank you all so much for uh, just a really remarkable and robust conversation. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much.